so, uh, ah, you can't hear me at all, can you? Okay, that didn't work as uh, as planned. That was a bit loud. Um, so uh, this week I am here with uh, Mr. Niels Hartvik, uh, obviously the founder of, of Embraco. Um, hey, Niels, how are you doing? I'm doing good, thank you, and happy birthday. Thank you, thank you. And uh, so, how are how are things in uh, Denmark? Uh, good. Pretty yeah. Good. good. <laughs> so. Uh, no, no. You're about to say something. Uh, yeah. So obviously, uh, we've tried to line up, uh, I suppose, a mini interview as such, to kind of about the the past, uh, the present, and the future of Embraco. Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably best to kind of start uh, with the past then. Um, so uh, I suppose, what was the reason for creating Embraco, and how did the idea even come about? Because um, I think a lot of people would like to know about the inception of Embraco. How how did it come to fruit? Yeah, sure, by accident. Um, in many ways, um, uh, I uh, oh, we, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> All the time you want. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, the, the I think the the, the quick version was uh, the first job I got out of high school. I was working with a company. Uh, who made the first Danish CMS. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, and then uh, a lot of things happened in that company. Uh, and after a couple of years, I swore I would never work with CMS again. I've, I've, I really had enough. Um, Ten years later, you're still working with it. Yeah, I don't know. What, what, the, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> um, but but nonetheless, uh, anyway, I, w I went freelance and I... I, I Tried to do everything but but work with the CMSs, but eventually what I ended up doing was, as everybody else in you know uh, late 90s, uh, made my own CMS. Yeah. Uh, despite I uh, insisted that it wasn't a CMS. Um, what was it then if it wasn't a CMS? What did you call it? I didn't call it anything. <laughs> I, I remember one of my website clients, builder. One of my clients uh, calling uh, was calling it the. Ad Administrative system, which I think. Is Ooh. <laughs> Sexy name. Um, yeah, uh, it would have been awesome. Maybe we should just rebrand Embargo to the administrative system. <laughs> yeah. Sounds as far as, as sexy as the email I get from Microsoft right now. Um, but uh, well, a anyway, um, uh, it was still never meant to be branded as a CMS. Basically, it was just a, like a, a tool set that I used for for my clients as a freelancer. Yep. Uh, because I was really bad at estimating, so you know, the the less I had to invent, the 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 less money I would lose on projects. Um, uh, but uh, and and the idea was that I would have heavier clients. Um, but I mean, eventually, so it became, eventually it became a CMS, and and at one point that has, that must have been early 2003. I was involved as a freelancer in a in a project uh, for a uh, a wonderful Danish company called Austerne or The Seasons, which do like organic delivery uh, or delivery of organic uh, vegetables. And they use mm -hmm. what was a, about, what were every, like a new CMS that everybody talked about, and, and that was really awesome. So I thought that was interesting to be a part of that, that project. Uh, and for, for a couple of weeks, uh, when I was on that project, uh, almost every evening I told my wife, like, if this is the if this is the best CMS that's out there, uh, then I don't know if I could do anything that's better, but I definitely think it's too complex. So yep. maybe I should you know, do something about it. And then she eventually she just said, either now you're going to sh shut up or do something about it. Uh, and that was basically when I went and and I uh, registered the domain Umbrago. That, that's early 2003. Okay, so I suppose that leads me on to the, kind of the next question. So what was the decision from going... Uh, a freelancer and using your own tool as such, and then deciding, okay, I'm going to make this into a business or into a product that uh, I'm going to kind of sell or I'm going to push to other developers to use. What was what was the turning point in saying, okay, this is my own, I'm just using it for myself as a freelancer. How can I obviously get other people to start using it? Well, I, 
I, I don't think there's ever been a time where I thought, now, now we're going to turn this into a business or a product. Uh, the truth is actually that uh, while I was uh, a freelancer, I was in a, a shared office space in Copenhagen called Arena, uh, which was started by a guy called Thomas Masmukdal, who's also uh, one of the, he was the chairman of, uh, of Podio, so he's involved in a lot of startups. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he made that uh, like a shared office space at that time. And there was a lot of amazing people there, um, so developers, designers, and some of these started using Umbrago and they came with uh, uh, ideas on how it could be improved. Uh, so one of them was Anas Polas, who was one of the uh, 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 founders of, of Podio. Uh, another one was Kasper Bumbeck, who's founder of Chainbox. Mm -hmm. Not everybody know um, uh, they're doing some pretty cool uh, e-commerce stuff with Umbraco, but I think they're most famously known for hosting the uh, the after party. Every year. <laughs> yes. And every Man, year, we I'm just go and trash their offices. Every year, I'm, I'm sort of trying to tell Kat, but hey, you need to tell people about this really, really awesome you know e-commerce plugin you made from Umbraco. Uh, and every year, you're just like, no, we're just gonna have a party. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, but but they started to participate. And, and contribute, and mm -hmm. at the same time, this was uh, so. This probably now dates around uh, early 2004. Um, at the same time, the whole open source wave, uh, wave was sort of coming, not in the Microsoft world where uh, I was, uh, where where I was, but almost every every other place. And I just thought that sounds like a really awesome idea. And then. I don't know, one day I had something to drink and I posted on the Umbrago blog, hey, now it's going to be open source. Yeah, because that was going to lead me into my I next actually, question. Uh, yeah, so I actually think first I blogged very vaguely about something I was I called uh, Project Chili, which was sort of the code name for, for making Umbrago open source because I, I that was that was what my daughter was supposed to have uh, been named, but then she turned out to be a boy. Uh, so I thought that was kind of a cute name. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that. Um, so, uh, but eventually that became Umbrago's open source, and, and the first version uh, of Umbrago's open source written in .NET was in beta in, I think it was October 2004, and then officially released as Umbrago 2.0 uh, on February 16, 2005. So that's sort of the official birthday of the Umbrago project. Okay, that's cool. So I suppose that leads me into the next question about was there any kind of real decision from going, I suppose not closed source, but uh, the project was not officially open source. What was, was it just like you say, a gut decision to wake up one day and just go, okay, today it's going to be open source? Or was there more kind of ideas or decisions behind that uh, uh, no, decision? No, there, there was nothing but a gut feeling, then just the idea that you know, it would. I, now I've tried to collaborate with a couple of people, and that was amazing. Mm -hmm. I sort of thought, well, what if we could collaborate even more, and if if more people could use this? I mean, it never had a license fee anyway, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So good. So I mean, that was how it happened. No business plan, no uh, no fancy considerations. I mean, you've been working with me, so you know how I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if the gut feeling is there, then you know that's that's where I'm going. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's fantastic uh, to hear. Definitely the right decision. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, nearly eight eight years on, and obviously it's a it's a big success. So uh, it's obviously a big decision that uh, I'm I'm sure you're very happy with. Yeah, I mean, I I always tell the story about how uh, you know before Brown went open source, maybe there was thirty sites running it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's not bad. You know, yeah. For, for personal CMS. Uh, but um, then after it came open source from February to I think it was sometime in June, I just remember we we had reached a thousand downloads and that was like a crazy number. Yeah. I I remember just telling my wife, hey, now there's a, you know a thousand people who've downloaded in Barcelona. And, and today, I mean, we we can see at least 500 confirmed installs of Umbraco, probably more downloads every day. Yeah, uh, that's so insane that's, in terms of yeah, like I mean, the early yeah. days. You're talking about you're getting excited about a, a thousand downloads, and you're talking about nearly like half that number every day. Um, yeah, that's it's insane. Pretty, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so another common question. Um, some people know this story, some people don't. But um, some people are unsure where the name Embraco comes from. Um, <laughs> to elaborate. Uh, yeah, um, that's that's one of the good stories. Um, so I had to come up with a name 
So it wasn't called the administrative system. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's uh, yeah. you should rename and it. I, uh, and I wanted something that wasn't, you know, about site or web or builder, because or, it just sounds so cheesy, right? Yep. Um, uh, so, so I thought, you know, the, uh, I think in English it's called Allen key, uh, you know, the stuff that you use to, uh, to uh, uh, put together IKEA furniture. Oh, okay, yeah, so an Allen key, like a, a mini in, wrench. In Denmark, in, in Denmark, everybody calls them umbracos. Uh, and I thought, hey, I, you know, I can't do anything with my hands, but, you know, at that time I had, you know, you know, put together quite a, assembled quite a, quite a number of IKEA furniture. So I thought, hey, you know, it's kind of the same thing I want with Umbrago that, you know, even though you're not really good at producing sites or maybe not a kick-ass developer, then it would yep. be amazing, you know, make pretty nice uh, websites. Uh, hopefully more beautiful and more stable than IKEA furniture. But <laughs> Yeah, of course. I, so I thought that's probably a, a registered trademark. So I Googled it. Um, and I, I think I found like, I don't know, 10,000 results or something. Enough you know, to make it seem like, okay, I'm, I'm searching for the right thing here. And mm -hmm. there was no trademarks. So I thought, hey, you know, maybe I should try to file for a trademark. So I you know, send, a, send an application to the, uh, believe it or not, it's in Denmark it's called the Patent Office. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, that's where you register trademarks in Denmark. And I got to respond a couple of weeks later saying, yeah, sure. Yeah. And I was like, hey. I got the trademark from Prado. I was like, I'm the king of the world now, right? Uh, and then, I, of course, that's that was the name. And then I think it was, I don't know, 2004, 2005. A guy called Klaus Day, uh, a really fantastic guy. Uh, he has a blog called Classy.dk. Um, he made a blog post where he wrote something like, with all the system that's on the market. And in 2004, there was like infinite number of CMSs yeah. out there. Um, I would never pick one with a bug in its name. And then he linked to an Australian company called Unbreak Co. with an N and a K, which is the official name for these uh, screws with that hexagon in. Okay, yeah. So actually the first Umbrella logo, hang on, because I, I got it here somewhere. Um, yeah, so the first Umbrago logo, it actually looked like this. I, I have oh, yeah, I remember, yeah, the, the kind of the free hexagons. A very limited edition. Uh, <laughs> there's only two, two editions of, uh, of this, uh, this T-shirt in the world. So that was the first uh, logo, and I, I, I just remember I was sitting at a client when I was reading that um, uh, uh, blog post. I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> what to do now? And I, you know, I, I was... I had the Umbrago interface open and the hexagon was in the corner. I was just like, no. <laughs> and I love that logo. Um, but, um, well, now it's just, you know, now it's just called Umbrago and every now and then, you know, people call us. And I was going to say, do you, get re do you get requests for these Allen keys? Do people just ring you up and go, can I order yeah, like yeah, yeah, a 500 Allen keys? Yeah. And every now and then, you know, we have these, uh, we have this reception service. Now they sort of learn to, to tell people that, you know, uh, uh, it's probably not the company you're looking for, but in the beginning, you know, you would have people calling, say, "I would love, love to know the strength of a half inch." <laughs> and then, you well, know, would you would you just casually reply? Sometimes you were just tempted to say five and a half. <laughs> <laughs> then see a building collapse two years later. Um, but, but yeah, but I mean, uh, we're at that point now that it, at least in Denmark, if you try to Google for the right way of spelling on Braco, it actually automatically auto corrects us. Ah, uh, classy. That's like that's like the Macintosh, right? You change the spelling of the of the Apple uh, California. Yep. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Yeah, so that's uh, the story of the name. So that's why we, you know, all people in in England believe we are named after some weird commercial that went on in the eighties or something like that. Uh, and and in Brazil, Braco pretty much. Is the word for giving a hug, which is kind of nice, right? Oh, that's a nice, that's a nice translation. Yeah, yeah. the friendly. Yeah, so, so, so some, so you know, there's two ways of still telling the story. You know, if you have a really nice client, you can tell them the real story, and if you have a much more corporate, you just say, "Hey, that's the Brazilian name for a hug." Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure that'll go down well. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there any kind of official pronunciation? Nope. No, but I think this robot made a video once with. 30 people pronouncing it in... in ah, yes, ways. yes, yes, I, uh, it's I remember a, It's that. an agile name. <laughs> ah, agile. In the way you want. <laughs> <laughs> 
So um, I'm just skimming through my notes. So back when you first started the project, did you ever imagine the project being such a success it is today? So obviously, back in the early days, there was only a few hundred or so developers on the Yahoo mailing list. And no, it wasn't even a few hundred. I mean, it was you know, it was a handful of the okay. same actors. So Casey Niehaus, Douglas Robart, Jesper Ord, Robertson, Ismail, um, you. So yep. it was, you know, it was. It was kind of intimate. I could also <laughs> feeling this. That was that was good good time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously, um, obviously from that small collection, obviously we're now looking at uh, thousands of developers on R using it, um, global brands using it to power their sites. So did you, when you first kind of created Umbraco, did you ever imagine kind of getting to this kind of scale of things? Of course not. I mean, it's it's crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. So you tell you every now and then you wake up and you have to I don't know in Danish, in Danish we have this uh, expression where you, where you sort of say you, you so sort of, I don't know what this is called you sort of do like this to see if you're awake uh, you pinch I can't see. your you, oh, okay yeah pinching your arm right yep. uh, to see if you're awake so every now and then it's just like this is this is crazy right this is yeah fantastic yeah okay. nice nice dream uh, to be uh, living yep. Yeah, very nice. So, uh, so another question uh, before we kind of move on to the next section. Um, so, obviously, there's been some mistakes in the past. Obviously, with version five and an old favorite of mine, the Umbraco uh, product. I don't know the connection sort of. Oh, 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 okay, yeah. So, <laughs> and obviously, my, minus that. And uh, do you remember obviously Umbraco stats as well? That was uh, another favorite of mine before it got dropped. And uh, so it's, it's great to know that you've learned from these mistakes and recovered well from them. Um, what I would like to know, how did you come to the decisions to kind of draw a line under those kind of products or versions and things like that? So how did you come to those decisions? Okay, yep, this is enough and uh, and kind of move on. Oh, well, I mean, it, 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 you know, it's different from project to project. I mean, in Braga stats, it was kind of funny because that was sort of a tool. Uh, people probably don't know it, but it was. Yeah, this is very old. It was the first commercial package on Umbrago, and I had this hope that maybe it was basically something I made for a client, and I had this hope that maybe you know this could help finance some of the uh, of uh, of the development. So I think it was a small statistic package. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine I don't know a crappy server side edition of Google Analytics. Like Five percent of Google Analytics, one percent maybe. Um, and <clears throat> it was made for my clients who had almost no traffic. Right? I mean, yeah. so obviously when people try to use it on on field sites, uh, they got <laughs> like databases that went nuts. Um, uh, so obviously that was a really bad idea. It, it became pretty clear pretty pretty fast. I mean, I think Google Analytics came out two weeks after I launched. Umbrella yeah, exactly. Stats. It was around about the same time. And it just it yeah. became pretty evident. There was no reason to try to, you know, that wasn't the product that would help, you know, tax me not knocking on my door. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was kind of easy. I, version 5, I mean, it was, it's, it's, it's kind of a funny story if you think about it because uh, the decision to create Umbrago 5, when was that? I remember we took it at a, to create uh, version five, that was a, that was at a retreat. Uh, you know, every every year before Co Garden, mm -hmm. we're like 15 to 20 people who go to a country house for a week, yep. uh, weekend for sort of talk about the state of the project and what you would prioritize. Um, so that must have been 2010, maybe. Okay. okay. Yep. Uh, where we sort of 2010. 2011. I'm not sure about the dating. Uh, um, selective memory. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, when we sort of decided that you know maybe it's a good thing to rewrite Obrago. I mean, a lot of it had been created by me. Some of it's been created by Casper uh, Bombeck, and none of us are at that time, especially, were were really knowing what we were doing, and obviously never meant to be a, a system of this scale. So. Yeah. The only thing I wanted was creating something that was really, really simple to use, mm -hmm. simple to implement. Um, and of course, as as it became more and more popular, you know, people started criticizing the source. And and I think at one point I sort of felt that it took away too much focus. Uh, you know, I was I was sort of getting tired of 
of seeing it being bashed on yeah. various, you know, uh, blogs and social outlets, mm -hmm. just the code quality. And yeah. and it was sort of people forgot to look at the merits that, you know, it was actually still, even though it wasn't created probably, it was mm -hmm. still fast, it was secure, yeah. uh, it actually did the job. But then I, I think at some point I sort of just gave up on that battle and I was like, okay, then let's do that complete rewrite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because at the same time, in ASP.NET MVC was coming, and I really loved a lot of the stuff uh, uh, in that project, and I thought, well, maybe that's you know, maybe that's the opportunity to sort of do the rewrite that everybody says you shouldn't do. So at uh, at a retreat, we sort of figured that would be that would be fun. I mean, who doesn't think a rewrite project is fun, right? Yeah. Um, so we sort of started that, and you know, in hindsight, it's the most you know, stupid thing ever done because it's sort of the whole focus around Bravo 5, uh, the focus of the project moved from being can we make a tool that sort of, I don't know, it's a cliche to say empower, but you know, this tool that makes people who are just web developers who maybe don't care about uh, server side code yep. able to build quite advanced sites that are fast and secure and, and you know, scales. Um, and it sort of moved to being all about tech, for the sake of tech. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, we have you can swap your IOC container. Who the fuck even cares about an IOC container when you do websites? Yeah. So I mean, if you are you know making massive uh, uh, applications, then then it's, then it might be interesting. But in this case, if I don't, it doesn't matter. But no. you know, it, it sort of became a eventually more like a university project than you know. A, a product, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and and at the same time that the whole V five development phase came, uh, my own son was diagnosed with deep diabetes, which obviously sort of took away a lot of my focus. Uh, yeah, that's not an excuse, but I mean, <laughs> you know how how uh, you know personal, personal stuff gets in the way. Uh, and uh, and in in the middle of it all, I also uh, got a got a slip disc in my back, so I had to lay down for like eight weeks. So I mean, uh, my my responsibility in that project sort of I just disappeared. I didn't I didn't watch that project enough. Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of letting it live its own life, and and in hindsight, I I kind of realized that if there's one role I I have in this project, it's sort of being I don't know really good at having an idea of when it is something. Uh, balance the arrival way. Uh, yeah. Let's put it uh, like the. I love simplicity. I love you know pragmatic solutions. I. That's you know that's sort of the thing that I uh, that that I love and I uh, I really wasn't active enough in in the V5 process. Uh, so eventually when it got released, you know it you know our, all our internal tests showed that you know we had created something that was flexible. It looked yeah. like Umbrago. It the internal tests we had showed that it was fast. I yeah. had no idea how those tests were made. Um, so when we released it, we thought, hey, now we're ready for a new chapter, right? Yeah. And then I remember that uh, 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 those of us internally who were working on course materials started making course material for V5, and that was about the same time as, as you know, the first people started testing on and yeah. said, hey, we love the flexibility, but, but then people also started to say, hey, Kind of slow, yeah. and uh, that was also when, what we felt when we uh, uh, when we made the course material, and we were like, we don't understand this because we have these fancy test reports that show that it's really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I mean, I guess we were in some sort of denial, uh, yeah. doing that, um, and we thought it it would be better, and we had a lot of plans on how to make it better, and then we shipped five one, and it was still not. I mean nowhere near fast. Yeah. And in parallel with that, we sort of realized what Umbrago really is, because the software is one thing, the community is one thing, but then sort of the third leg of Umbrago is uh, is all the community add-ons. Yeah. And all of them were gone. I mean, none of them work with uh, Umbrago 5. And at the same time, you know, increasingly people said it's too complex, we can't debug it, we can't understand it, it's slow. Um, and then we had an independent review done 
uh, by a uh, really, really great uh, uh, software engineer, and he sort of said that you know, it's it's not you know the, the sort of the the code base that everybody says is fantastic is is one big mess. Uh, okay. So I remember going to uh, to the retreat uh, with the agenda of what the fuck are we going to do with version five? No. Uh, we had we had the Umbrago uh, conference where. Uh, 350 people would come, and it was all about V5. The whole agenda was about V5. Um, and then, then you know, at that retreat, we sort of talked through the state of uh, of uh, of the uh, of the project. And, and a couple of weeks prior to that, I, you know, uh, the the main architect of uh, of, of Umbrago 5 uh, uh, was asked to leave, and you know, so we basically were like, we need a fresh start. Uh, what can we yeah. do about the project? Um, and I mean the consensus at that, the conclusion of what we had to do was was almost taken immediately. Like, if, but nobody dared to sort of say it out loud. That, you know, we just have we have to can this project. Uh, and I remember just one evening, uh, on the, I think it was on the second day, sort of saying, "What if we can the project?" And, you know, there was just complete silence. Uh, and then, you know, uh, I I think. You know, I don't remember the right quote, but it, yep. one guy said something like, "It would be the right thing to do, but but that's not an option." I was like, "Why? Why isn't it an option? What's, yep. what's the alternative, really?" I mean, uh, and I think you know, I talked about that in the code garden uh, keynote from from 2012, so so it's online if you want to watch it. But yeah. it was sort of, it was you know, it was the right thing to do because we were we, we had this. Thing that looked like Umbrago, but definitely wasn't Umbrago. It wasn't friendly. It wasn't fast. It wasn't easy to implement. Uh, it's it not was, what Umbra people know as Umbrago. Exactly. Exactly. So you know, we did the stuff you couldn't do, and I think uh, every every uh, CMS producer out there who consider us as their competitors, you know, sort of clap their hands and starting uh, deep so you make you know material against Umbrago. Uh, but, it, but it was to be expected, and but I think you've recovered well, and exactly, nearly, a, nearly a year on, it's the the project's doing fantastic. Yeah, and we're doing better than you know we did before. But so I mean, the truth is that you know it was insane to sort of to sort to sort of uh, uh, drop uh, V five, and a bit like a lot of other decisions, we didn't sit down and you know look at our economy in the company or. That okay, how do we, how are we going to handle this? Yeah. Um, so just again, it was you no, know, it was the right thing to do, and eventually, so then, based on that knowledge, you know, the gut feeling was just we have to, even I don't know if we can afford one out of the company, uh, but but there is there isn't another option. It's the right thing to do. Yeah. So of course, I mean, after Code Cotton 12, you know, uh, after going like this for for quite a while, it just went. <laughs> Um, in terms of you know, people didn't go on courses. Uh, our sales totally declined. Uh, the energy among everybody in the project, especially in the HQ, was just. I mean, I, we were all like really, really sad. I think that's sort of the right word. Yeah, uh, but obviously a lot of effort was put in, and uh, it's understandable. Yeah. But like you say, it was but definitely done for like, the right after, reason. Yeah, after like six months. Um, uh, so I mean, after uh, after that uh, in June, we just worked everything we could uh, on uh, on you know making things good again. And I think after like by the end of the year, we sort of got the feeling that you know maybe the project is coming back again. And yeah. then uh, I mean, the last I mean, 2013 have been amazing. It's just been you know now it's going like this again slowly, yeah. but 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 steadily. And I think this Coca this year was was. It was like a good old Umbrago event, right? It, yeah, no, it was back to its roots and back to how exactly. I remember it from the early days. Exactly, and I, I mean, I spoke to Tim internally uh, uh, just the other day. He said, uh, "It's I'm having a great time. It's like uh, the early years of Umbrago. And I think that's sort of spot on where we're heading now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I suppose uh, we'll chat about a few things about the present. Um, so like in like we said earlier, um, in the past and very early days, it was ecstatic if you reached a thousand downloads. But uh, but now that number being fairly small in the scheme of things, what are the kind of current usage stats looking like from Braco today? Yeah, I mean I uh, I think I haven't you know it. 
I, I don't have all the latest numbers. Uh, there are some pretty uh, uh, pretty updated numbers in from the Umbrero uh, Co Garden keynote still. That's yep. also. But I just went. We have this uh, we have this live track of version six installs and. Yep. As I, as I told you right before we started this, I mean, I, I wish we would have this talk tomorrow, tomorrow, because we would have <laughs> yeah. uh, 50,000 uh, installs of uh, of uh, Umbrella Six, but now we're on 49,636. Uh, that's fantastic. That's completed, that's completed installs of Umbrella Six. So that's completed yeah, that's, and running active sites yeah. as such. Cool. That is, uh, yeah, that's fantastic that's, news. That's uh, Umbrella Six alone. So that's. Pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah, no, that's uh, fantastic. Considering version six is what less than was, like was it six, months? seven months old? Yeah, I think nine. Nine. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, so uh, <laughs> fine. So uh, leading on from that, um, have you seen any statistics or any usage stats in terms of uh, people using the MVC mode? No, unfortunately, we don't like that. Uh, that's, uh, that's a shame. Uh, yep. I mean, we have swapped uh, swapped the courses, so we train in MVC now, and in version seven is going to be MVC by default. Uh, that was uh, the next part of the question, I suppose. When when is uh, MVC coming by default? So version seven, yes. Yeah, I mean, for a long time uh, internally, we would we would really want MVC to be sort of the the default thing, but it, you could argue that it's a breaking change. Uh, so so that's why we we. We considered adding it for 6.2, who's, who's, which is coming uh, in a couple of weeks. Yep. But, uh, but eventually, we, we said it's it's sort of a breaking change to change the, the default behavior, and, and it's going to be in 7. So will, but, so will it be uh, still in the, the, the config in terms of if yep. you wanted to go back to web forms, you can? Yeah. OK. Yep, of course. Because um, uh, I don't think we should dictate uh, how people, uh, you know, one of the uh, cornerstones of Umbrago is constantly, you know, we we do some some qualified defaults, but there w there's always a, a way in Umbrago that you can, you know, uh, have it your way. And yeah. uh, I think a lot of people still like uh, web forms or or have a job where maybe their boss won't let them invest in learning new technology. Yeah. But yeah. If you ask me, MVC is the only sane. Uh, choice today, but um, yes, that's my uh, personal opinion. But but I think it's important as a as a as a sort of framework uh, uh, producer to to sort of respect that you know it's not everybody who can move as as fast as uh, as you want. Yeah, and it, it's nice, like you say, you're not dictating to the users of the product to say you must uh, in version seven. There's only going to be MVC and. If you want to use web forms, you're going to have to use version six. Um, so it's nice that you're going to still kind of support it. Um, so leading on uh, from that, uh, so the product and the company is maturing all the time, it seems. Uh, you seem to be adapting and evolving. So how do you manage to keep the, the HQ engine running so smoothly with such a distributed team all over the world? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not smooth. <laughs> uh, behind the scenes, it's not smooth. If you, if you open the doors, it's, it's one, uh, I think if the marketing version is that it's one very agile company. Um, <laughs> OK. What's uh, the real I mean, answer? <laughs> like no, obviously we've we've matured along the way, um, uh, but I mean it's and especially hiring Sebastian as a as a PM on uh, on the call uh, helped stabilizing uh, uh, the call and sort of the development of the call. Uh, so it's not like it's it's all just uh, chaos, um, but uh, I mean mindset wise, I hate the word startup, but but oh, I dislike. Don't yeah. hate anything. Um, uh, but of of course, I mean, you know, I think one charm of the HQ also working there is that it's it is. Uh, I mean, you know, from your time there, I mean, yeah. it's it's a uh, it's crazy because you know, we could hire I don't know, thirty people to try to keep up with. Uh, with the demand and request, then we would still not be there. But yep. no, we can only afford being these eight people we are right now. Um, so, so you know, we're we're doing our best to keep up, and we have you know our own ideas of, of what we want to do. And I think one big help in run making the HQ run more smoothly and and give us a chance to think a little bit further than just three months ahead uh, yep. has definitely been uh, 
the Gold Partner program and how we're now actually approaching 30 Gold Partners. Um, uh, there was two Gold Partners signing up today, which is... Ah, fantastic, fantastic. news. Yep. Can't uh, share? So, no, I, I think I better ask them first. But, uh, okay, fair enough. Uh, but two British companies. We, ah, oh, fantastic I, news. I love, I love, um, but uh, but that, that definitely meant that, you know, now we know we have this amount of money that we can invest in the call. Um, and I think the call partners are, uh, I don't know, uh, sort of financing 60 to 70 percent of, uh, of the call work the next year. Yeah, uh, that's, so it, it's that's pretty one of the things, It's one of the things, for instance, that meant that, you know, we can work on both version 6 and version 7 at the same time. Yeah, uh, I think people. I think people think that we make more money than we do. Uh, so it's uh, it's uh, you know even though there's 500 people installing uh, uh every day, it's it's less than one one percent who uh, uh, who actually becomes customers. Yeah, so, you know, and and you know, it's not like a customer could be like a TV 19 euro TV subscription, or it could be like a a gold partner. Uh, yeah. Just, in so it's, you know, it's it, we're doing our. I mean, we're doing our best to keep up. We have a we have an amazing team right now. I mean, the guys, yeah. the, the HQ team at the moment, the energy is fantastic. Uh, so and uh, and of course it also helps that we finally, you know, change the culture around the core from being the HQ handle everything to yep. sort of be, you know, we can handle the management of the project and we can handle sort of the the you would call it the visions and and sort yes. of the major major uh, uh, improvements to the call, but but it's also you know the community and people who are you know making a living on you know, but also are responsible. <laughs> and, now, I mean, and people do that now because we're much more honest and direct in what we need. Uh, so so I think that helps a lot. So we've seen. Almost 150 pull requests. I was going to say it's probably since Sebastian's joined, um, obviously, and along with the the new issue tracker. Um, I think that's helped the the project uh, considerably in terms of, like you say, uh, getting pull requests uh, and even moving the project to GitHub as well. Just making uh, simple been, things. That's been a major. I mean, we've seen more pull requests uh, being on GitHub for four months than we've seen being on Codeplex for what six years. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, people might say, you know, we used to know Mercurial and 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 we don't know Git, but then the few who know Git contribute. Let's put it that way. I mean, I I think of 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 course it's it's two things. One thing is of course moving to a tool where GitHub does an amazing job, and the other part is is uh, a, a shift in culture and mindset yeah. where we sort of ask people to help. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's brilliant. Um, so I suppose we should uh, move on to looking about uh, the future. So obviously, uh, Lee Kelleher has, uh, has asked this question. So now that the Umbraco project is what, maybe eight, nine years old? Um, eight. Eight, okay, eight years old. Um, is grown and evolved over the years, and as our needs as users have changed, where do you see the web and the state of CMSs going in the next five years? Yep, I, uh, first of all, in terms of CMSs, I think we've finally seen Sort of the one of the old ideas of Umbrella Group uh, happened, which is you know a CMS is just default. When Umbrella Group started, uh, not a lot of uh, a lot of uh, websites used the CMS because it was expensive or really complicated to get started. Yep. Uh, now we are seeing that you, you almost don't make a website uh, without having a CMS. Uh, and I think one of the important things in the future is then uh, for Umbrella Group at least. To uh, improve on simplicity, so we're seeing a lot of uh, in the CMS world. We're seeing a lot of complexity being added, and now it's not good enough to be a CMS. Now we have to be something else, uh, like uh, uh, being able to handle uh, uh, social media, being able to handle uh, uh, digital marketing, tracking of users, profiling of users, and all that. And I think yep. from Brago. Uh, I think there's a big role for us to to sort of stay being a CMS and let people who are really good at all the other things do that, mm -hmm. and then focus on how can we simplify CMS. Uh, I think one of the, for instance, one of the reasons that WordPress is growing really, really fast is it's really good at being simple. I mean, it's yep. 
I don't consider WordPress to be a, a really, really uh, great CMS. It's an amazing blogging engine, really good for small sites. Um, but one thing it does very well is uh, that it's really easy to get started. It's, it auto-updates in an amazing way. Uh, mm -hmm. So the whole infrastructure and cost around running a CMS project is very low in a WordPress uh, project. And I would love Envira to head in that direction, uh, which is one of the things, for instance, we're doing with, uh, with uh, Umbrago as a service, where we sort of try to do two things. One is making it really, really simple to get started with Umbrago and everything that's infrastructure around it. And the other part, which is, you know, uh, uh, um, making it really, really easy to to develop sites also in teams. So I think it was Morton the other day internally he coined uh, something we're working on right now on Embraer Service as uh, we're making GitHub for CMS. Uh, so that's uh, that's sort of the one of the other directions. And and the same thing goes with Embraer Seven and the UX we're doing there. Mm -hmm. uh, and try to make things as simple as as possible as as humanly possible and. Uh, for now, the focus have, have been on making it really easy for editors and the stuff that they do every day, make sure that, uh, that we make that even simpler. But, but moving on from that, uh, there's also a lot of things we can do around uh, uh, designers and developers working with them. Probably. So yeah, that sounds exciting. Simplify, 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 simplify. And back to the roots of Umbrago, which is have a simple framework that handles all the plumbing uh, really unsexy stuff, but just being really good at that, having a culture that's all about sharing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, whether it's knowledge or assets, uh, and then on top of that, having the flexibility in the system so you can sort of bend it, bend it to your needs. But probably with just a slight uh, uh, bigger focus on best practices, so it's not you know, completely chaotic. So, for instance, one of the things that we're going to work on uh, post V7 is simplifying uh, queries in race and making sure that there's like one good solid way of doing that. Yeah, that'll be Whereas, fantastic because obviously yeah, it is, sort of, you can do it this it way, evolved, you can do it this way. It's so evolved too organic and there's uh, too many ways of doing things. Yeah, uh, that's kind so, of that. So no, that would be nice to uh, unify that. And it sounds like in the next five years or so, it's uh, the project's going to get uh, very interesting. Obviously, like you say, it's going to get a lot more simpler uh, and back to its roots, which uh, I'm going to look forward to. Yep, um, me too. So uh, moving on. Um, so unless you've been living under a rock, we know that version 7, the artist formerly known as Bell, is coming soon. So yep. package developers, other developers who like to extend the back office with sections, trees, dashboards, etc. Uh, will they have a steep learning curve to having to reskill in order to build these kind of add-ons, additions to the the Umbraco back office? It depends. Um, <laughs> That's vague. Uh, the, the short the short answer is that we've done a lot of work to ensure that all packages will work. All packages that extend the tree and uh, uh, custom sections that it will continue to work on on uh, on Bell. You don't have to do anything. Uh, basically, we're just doing the same thing as we're doing in version six. You know, your app runs in an iframe, but uh, you know, you get the you get the new trees and you get uh, uh, the new sections. Um, obviously, you probably want to adapt to the the bell way, mm -hmm. and there's sort of things in that. One is obviously that we're moving from a, uh, a web forms architecture and and sort of relying on this fake sort of state and the uh, net controls to generate UI. Mm -hmm. to sort of uh, being a more native web, which means that we have a, a, a pure uh, HTML JavaScript front end that then calls services, uh, REST services. Uh, so if you are like a diehard web forms developer, then you would of course need to make sure that you, you, know, you know your JavaScript and HTML in a really nice way. Yep. Uh, you will have to learn AngularJS, which is the JavaScript framework that, that we are working on. Are using, and mm -hmm. there's some amazing tutorials on, online uh, for learning Angular. Uh, and then, of course, you also need to understand, sort of, your, your mindset-wise, you need to adapt to this idea that you, know, you have a separated front end and then requests for for data to update uh, its interface. So that's sort of one thing. The other thing, which I actually think might be even more difficult, is adapting to the UX mindset of of Bill, where 
in, in Umbrago so far, it's been really easy to make custom packages because you could sort of hide all your UI behind the right-click menu. Yep. Uh, if you ever worked on a really large Umbrago installation with a lot of packages, you've sort of just seen the context menu just do like this. Oh, massively, yeah. Um, and one of the things that's kind of key central with Bell, and, and some of, one of the things that's been quite difficult uh, is sort of changing that into making sure that, you know, the choices you have are uh, very direct, it's very simple, uh, and nothing is hidden behind weird menus anywhere. Uh, so we are, we are constantly working on, you know, making sure that the default editors, when we ship 7, sort of dictate best practices around that, and, and we'll also uh, post that, work on having a document for people wanting to extend the UI. Sort of I was going to say, is there, was there going to be kind of some, some standardization? Sort of recipe. Have some recipes they can copy from. Because if you're a sole developer uh, making pages, I think that's going to be the hardest thing in it. And if you do uh, your UI the way you would do it in version 6 UI, it sort of stains out and blinks and doesn't feel girlish. Yeah. Uh, even though it's skinned like girl. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think that's the biggest challenge. Definitely one of the one of the things that, that we will have to work on. Uh, yeah, but if you're going to uh, give documentation in regards to that or best practices or a guideline in terms of how to style or uh, create a, a component, then, uh, yeah, it's going to fit in a lot better than, uh, than it would today. Yep. Um, so Peter Duncanson asks, uh, with Bell, how can we expect existing sites and data types work with it? There's a lot of talk of using just iframes and some magic so that it all just works. But is that the case? And what about the U component data types? Have they been tried or converted? Yeah. Uh, and that's one thing where we've been apparently not direct enough. Because if there's one thing that doesn't work in Bell and 7, it's property editors or data okay. types. That's, the, that's that and custom macro parameter editors, if anybody even ever know what that is. Uh, that's two things that's not backwards compatible. And in fact, the only two. Um, uh, which is sort of if we we had some prototypes on supporting all property editors, but then the whole experience of Bell would sort of sort of crash. So we we made a, sort of the decision not to support that. So, if so you I've, gone. Been in, I've been in touch with uh, with Lee Kelleher from from the U Components team, and they have ideas on how to do things, and that's also why we've been so supportive. So supportive on local meetups, learning to make new property editors, uh, because it's one of the things that needs to to happen and hopefully happen yep. pretty. So I, you know, I really hope the U components guys will get help uh, uh, in making uh, you know the best of U components available for build pretty fast. Uh, also stuff like Damp and, and similar popular packages. Yeah. Uh, no. So, so I, you know, I, as I said before, uh, and we have stats that prove it, even though people keep saying uh, it's not uh, valid. Uh, you know, you don't upgrade. Uh, you, usually, you don't upgrade in private. And I think, especially here, where the UI change, you won't upgrade your clients. I don't I mean, think it you, would make sense to. Uh, but of course, I mean, it's lesson learned from V5 that you know, if your components won't work, um, then. Uh, then you know it's going to take longer time uh, for V5 to or V7 to uh, <laughs> whoa <laughs> uh, for, uh, for for V7 to sort of get uh, get an uptake. But I I hope it, it it's going to go really fast because because you know your clients are going to love Bill. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose uh, you're saying that property editors uh, is going to be the breaking change. So with that in mind, if I have a site that, if I was to upgrade, if I had a site that had U Components property editors inside that site, I suppose that site wouldn't be fully upgradable as such. Is that right? Uh, all your beautiful U Components editors would be replaced with a label. Uh, so they, they would so just be read only. <laughs> Lose any data, but you won't be able to edit it, which you could argue is sort of a problem in a CMS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, I suppose that's a, a kind of a graceful way but to. If you implement it aside using completely native uh, um, uh, core editors, then you could upgrade it because they are they are converted one to one. Okay, cool. That's fantastic news. Um, I'm just coming a quick through my notes. Um. 
Uh, I suppose this was just similar to what I've just asked you, but Pete uh, Duncanson asks again, uh, so will Bell work with existing sites or just uh, new builds only? Again, uh, it depends on the implementation. Uh, but it's important to emphasize that runtime-wise, we haven't changed anything. So under the hood, it's still the same APIs yep. in solid that are version 6 and things like that? Yep. So it's only the back office in terms of UI? Uh, that's changed. Okay. So that's fantastic. Um, I'm just waiting to see if there's any more last minute questions, but uh, let's take a look. Don't you have, don't you have real work to do? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's my birthday. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, looks like there's no more questions, so I think we'll wrap it up. Oh, yeah. very nice. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me. And yeah, no, it's a good chatting. Yep, good to see you again. And I'll see you next week in Manchester, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just need to sort the train, but yeah. Yeah, I'll come pick you up. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, chatting, Nils. Well, have thanks. a birthday again. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.